Hey there, and welcome to the European Jazz Club. We are the band known as The Last Standee. We've got a sweet gig lined up with three groovy games that will be like music to your ears. My name is Fusion Fen, and we're joined here today by, on keyboard drums, Cool Cadence Cara. <laughs> hey there. And on paintbrush microphone, it's the awesome Arpeggio Audrey. Hi everyone! If you'll excuse us, we'll soon be setting, settling down and waxing lyrical about the gig, getting a little frantic with Forest Shuffle before ending this podcast with a blast of bombastic dynamite that is Banner Festival. But first, it's time for some introductions. Take it away, Kara. <laughs> Hi, um, yeah, so um, happy to be here. And um, so. I am um, oh, just happy to ha have uh, Easter break and uh, can relax a little um, after a very stressful weeks. But um, yeah, so um, actually not much going on in my life apart from renovating house, moving, training my dog some more. And yeah, so what about you, Audrey? Um for me well i've been in another episode like uh, not very long ago which uh is nice because i've been away for a while uh, and it's nice uh, getting again in touch with all of you uh so for me yeah a bit of more kdm with alexis um a bit more board gaming with my husband uh mostly we've been playing some uh the last unlock uh that was out uh, a few months ago so we did all the three scenarios and they were quite nice. Um, I managed to finally, let's say, get along with Splendor um, for my uh, husband's birthday. We went to the board game cafe and uh, with friends and we played a four people uh, game of Splendor, N normal version, not the Marvel one. Anything else? And uh, it was the very first time I didn't not feel confused by the game. Well, maybe I should say my second time because the first time was on the Marvel one, so I don't know if the differences make it enough for me to feel comfortable with the game, but um, I'm happy my relationship with it is is better. If, even though I still don't think that it's a game that brings much to the table, to be honest. Uh, been wanting to finish the Aeon Trespass Odyssey uh, cycle one, but um, we are not really making the time for it. And uh, the last piece of news is that uh, I, I mentioned it uh, right on in the written in the uh, our personal channel on the Discord, but uh, I've put a down payment for a board gaming table. Uh, that's not. Uh, one of in in one of the main uh, websites it's a completely custom one by made by a local woodworker uh so we could like give our the exact dimensions that we want so we're going to have a gaming um area of 90 uh by 160 i think centimeters and a 10 centimeters border uh 10, 10 wide with some uh, holes that could be used as uh, glass carriers or token uh, storers and stuff like that. That's going to help us uh, finish the on Trespass Odyssey a campaign, that's for sure, because their yeah, setup is really, really something that takes a long time, and I'm extremely happy uh, that we can get to take this step away for one campaign game. Uh, other than that, uh, Black Knight from KDM has arrived. Uh, I still have to build it, but uh, that's not going to take too much time. And then see with Alexis when he can come again to make the mini campaign. Yeah, that's uh, already uh, a nice bit of news. What about you, Fan? Since the last time I saw you, quite a few time has passed. Uh, yeah, it has been a little while. I've been... Uh, um busy enough uh, you know it's like that period of getting prepared before spring and it's time to cut the uh, the bushes clear out a couple died last year we don't know what happened something 
um, got them. Uh, so I've got to finish that and, and all of that kind of stuff, but i uh, just been waiting. Uh, board game front, um, just finished playing with the Killenium Butcher. Um, I literally posted a review about that this week. Uh, it'll be going. It'll be on Board Game Geek by the time this episode airs as well. Um, the short version, pretty positive. Uh, it's definitely better than the White Giga Lion, but it's also expensive. Um, yeah, I'm waiting on Black Friday to get it. To be honest, I, I think that's reasonable. Uh, definitely, uh, for sure. Uh, what else? Yeah, um, I've been playing through the Squire campaign. Um, be prepared for that. It's the second um, showdown fight is quite a number. Um, it's definitely the hardest part of the entire thing. Uh, yeah, so um, that's a that's a fun one. Uh, it is nice to have all that kind of things. I am getting close to finishing a five year project, which is this little box right here on my desk that I will talk about when it's done. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been an ongoing little thing I've done here and there, uh, so I will talk all about that. Uh, when it's finished. Um, and today I've just been uh, brushing up on my... on, on uh, got broken this game out and brushed myself back up on the rules in order to not only talk about it here, but we're going to be playing it over the weekend, uh, over this break weekend, with uh, the folks. Because um, it's, it's easy enough and straightforward enough for that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, which, which game? The game I'm going to talk about today, the gig. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry, I thought you, it was the project. Or okay. no, 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 no. I, they would not not be able to play what's in this project box at all. No, absolutely not. That would be uh, far too overwhelming for them. They can play um, uh, what you call it, um, Great Western Trail. So they are capable of some fairly complex games, but not to that extent okay not not this this thing here is 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 complex even for me and i'm quite familiar with the game i've set it up in so uh yeah it's it's oh um and age of apocalypse arrived early for me that's the marvel champions expansion um this whole marvel cycle has been incredible age of apocalypse is the last one um and it's really good the biggest thing i i want to sort of like say before we move on to the uh, subjects in respect to it is um, when they released um, the Thanos expansion box um, they put Thanos as the third boss and the last boss for the campaign is Loki and it just feels so weird to go here's the Thanos like you know Infinity Stone saga and Thanos is dealt with halfway through and then you're dealing with Hela and Loki who really should have just been put in their own Asgard kind of thing. Yeah. Age of Apocalypse, while they were releasing the spoilers, um, Apocalypse is in the third scenario and everyone was like, oh, not again. Um, but no, Apocalypse is in the third scenario and a different Apocalypse is in the fifth scenario and they are both really different uh, but classically Apocalypse and it is so uh, good. Oh, Especially nice. with like with um, you know the ninety seven remake continuation of X Men coming like that's out now. Um, it it's it's really cool to see this great well by by all accounts I've heard really good old cartoon um, of the X Men and and then there's this just fantastic box set to play through with um, uh, some the, the four Horsemen's one of the scenario uh, and it's really really good so i'll probably talk about it in full at some point in the future but yeah that's that's kind of been it kdm um age of apocalypse and brushing up on some other bits and pieces and uh painting my way through um hero quest yeah it's just something to get a project completely done that doesn't need to be absurdly well painted but it turns out the models are actually really good for single cast pvc yeah like but they're bonkers good, which is like really nice. So, so yeah, I, I don't have a comparison point, but yeah, definitely getting a small project once in a while that can be finished and done, and yeah, that that always feels good. It's still about fifty models I'm gonna have to do, but yeah, yeah, yeah it's um, it's not having to paint them uh, to as much of a standard, but uh, still. 
I finally finished the Marvel Crisis Protocol uh, Heroes card box. That's still 10 uh, heroes, but I'm still very, very happy to be done with it. Yeah, yeah, I really like it when the projects are like that and they're very small numbers of models, especially when they're good like, like those Marvel ones are. So that's mm. always nice. All right, well, uh, let's get on to our main topics. Uh, we've got a bone rattling opener number here. Uh, I am bringing you the gig from Brain Crack Games. Uh, which is a one to four player roll and write about being members of a jazz band, hence me playing around with the intro a little bit um, to just kind of theme a little. So this is said from Brain Crack Games. It was a Kickstarter, I think, last year. Um, I got it last year. Wow, you mean some Kickstarters don't deliver too late? No, uh, and also it seems like they are um making an aim to have this available at retail uh yeah although as it stands right now they have four copies of the kickstarter version on their own web store and that's kind of it so we'll see where we go with it i do have some comments on that near the end but let's just talk about the game and this is the first thing i want to talk about this i reckon you can sit down and teach this to people who have never played a roll and write or not really played many board games before and they'll know what they're doing within about five minutes, maybe 10 minutes at most. So uh, here we go. Uh, at the very start of the game, everyone will pick themselves an instrument. And there's these little song sheets. They are glossy, so you can you know, write on them and erase it's classic railroad ink kind of roll and writes. Uh, I put a couple of images in our Discord channel for Audrey and Cara to see. Um, and there, this makes the game asymmetric. So everybody is playing their own instrument. So they've got their own little grid that they're going to be drawing on, and they have their own special scoring rules. Um, but that's not all that there is. So what will happen then, once everyone's chosen their instrument, you'll also take a scoring sheet, which they're printed on the back of the instruments that are the, which aren't being used. Um, and they have a, a bunch of things you'll fill in. Then you will decide on the set list. So depending on the number of players, there's a card that tells you, hey, you're playing these songs and in this order. And there's six songs you'll be playing for the game. Uh, and there's a song book, which is a nice spiral bound linen finish book that you will flip to the page for the given song. Uh, it has a, a grid on it, or which is uh, five wide plus an extra column on the right hand side and then six up and down. Everyone will grab a pen, grab uh, dice, four dice. Um, they, in the core game, you'll have ones that match the instruments. and You can get extra dice to match the extra instruments as well. So it's nice to have them thematic. They're all just basically D6s, but instead of pips, they have musical notes. So they look very, they're colored, coordinated. They look very thematic. Um, they're, they're very nice. They feel nice. They look nice. Just classic wooden dice, uh, but with, with interesting pips. Okay, then you got your you got your set list. You got your song ready. Everyone's got their instrument. They got their pen. They got their dice, and you'll count down four, three, two, one, and begin. One-handed, people will roll their dice and decide if that's what they want, or they'll re-roll some of the dice. And when they've got a result they want, they will take it, same one-handed, and they'll put it on the song sheet in a given space. So the song sheet has six rows, and they correspond to the pips on the dice. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then you also have uh, five spaces. These spaces can be blank, or they can have symbols on them. The, the symbols are spotlights, flats, sharps, repeats, and rests, or black, blue, red, purple, green. What you're doing is you're trying to put your dice on and get yourself some of those symbols. But you're also trying to arrange your dice together to create a pattern. Um, a diagonals are allowed as well, which is kind of interesting and nice. What, and basically, that's it. That's this section, and it's done like real time, back and forth. If you reach a point where two people are trying to get to the same spot, then somebody's going to have to give way or you're going to have to work out something or maybe a third person will sneak in and take it. So it's very frantic. It's very jazz, you know, very kind of freeform. 
And that'll keep going until someone's put their fourth dice onto the song sheet because they're happy with what they've rolled and where they've put it. And then they will say, let's take it to the bridge. That means everyone else, if you're currently rolling dice, you can make that roll, but you may not roll again. If your dice are already on the table, then you're going to have to put them up onto the sheet with the numbers that you've rolled. So that's the first tension, is everybody's trying to get the best combination of dice for the symbols they want. They're trying to jostle for the places they want on the sheet, but they, um, they're they all racing to be the first person to do it and get done because it cuts everyone else's time, like Galaxy Trucker, if you've played that. Okay, so first... you, you have to be quick in your brain to think like, yes. oh, which what do I want? What do I re-roll? What do I keep? Blah, blah, blah. Yep. Maybe be the first... And you do, okay. absolutely. There's also a turn-based mode that they've included, so if that's not your jam, then there is an alternative. So they have thought about that, which is nice. But it feels right to be rolling into your tray, grabbing your dice, putting them out. And this is a quick game. This is like 20 minutes at most, so it's okay to be fast. It's okay to be frantic. It's okay to be messy. It's jazz, man. Um, anyway, so... There's another neat little thing, which is on the far right side, there's two columns um, and they correspond to each row and they're called the harmonies. And you can put a dice in there and it will score two points for each other dice in the same row. So if you've got a spare dice and it's you can't put it anywhere, you can try and score yourself up like a bunch of extra points uh, just by popping a dice into the harmonies. There's room for two different colored dice per row. So that's another little scoring area. Anyway, when we're at the bridge, all the frantic stuff like dies down and now it's time to sort all your bits and pieces out. And what you'll do is you'll look at the places that you've put your dice and you'll mark various symbols like the spotlights and the flats and, and similar. Uh, and then um, you will take your shape that you've got and you'll put it in on your instrument. So you don't have to draw the full shape, but you pick one block of the dice. So it might be like two or three or maybe even four dice in some kind of um, shape. And you'll draw it onto your board. Now, what's super interesting here is every board has a separate layout. They have a different entry point where you have to start drawing from. And you're just kind of ringing the symbols. So you might have a classic like T shape, you know three across, one down, you'll rotate that where you want to put it and fit it in. Maybe you've done four in a diagonal line and you'll use that instead. Or perhaps you can't use everything, you'll use two of them, maybe even one. Um, and those, those pieces on your instrument grid will have symbols on them or points and they will give you more notes to use during the game or score at the end, more spotlights to use or score with and more points. But also every instrument has its own special rule in respect to how it's going to score. So not only is your shape different, but also your, um, your scoring ability is different. For example, the vibraphone scores you five points for each separate groove, that's a shape, in your solo, so that's on your grid, that contains at least one of the 12 highlighted spaces in the center two rows. And you can do up to like six times because there's six different songs. You can score 20, uh, uh, like I think 24 points by doing that. Um, the Kickstarter example had 30 points, but it's it's 24 in the release. So you're there with the vibraphone. You're trying to make like discrete groups going across your vibraphone from the middle and branching outwards across each of the, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm not sure what you hit on a vibraphone, but you, you know, you can see what they look like. Um, Another example would be the organ, where you have two separate entry points. So you've got two tiny uh, piano-shaped organs, because you're playing two, because that's, you know, the jazz thing. Um, and you can start on either one, and you can switch back and forth. Uh, you'll score points on the lowest unenclosed space in the solo. Um, so basically, you're trying to cover everything. And if you enclose all of the spaces, you'll get 25 points there. So... Uh, the trumpet is kind of fun because you're looking to hit these note modifiers that sit under where the trumpet keys are and then you need to get to the end and enclose as many of the end notes as you can to get multiplied scores that way. So it's all really kind of um, fun as you're navigating a different grid from everyone else and you're scoring different things. 
Now the little extra um, wrinkles are the spotlights and the notation symbols. First of all, at the end of the game, the person who has the most of a given uh, group, colour, you know, like flats, will score five points for everyone who has less than them. Nothing uh, if somebody has the same as you, but the person with the same as you would also be scoring. So you're rewarded for hoarding these symbols. Uh, the spotlights you can use to buy audience cards that will give you special abilities or scorings or things like that. Or you can also hoard them to try and have the most at the end. On top of that, every set of uh, four different coloured symbols, flat, sharp, repeat, rest, that's worth five points at the end of the game if you don't spend them as well. Um, why would you spend them if they're worth points? Well, a flat lets you reduce the value of a dice uh, by one or turn a one into a six. So you can just rub it off your board get that ability. A sharp, reverse, you can increase by one. A repeat lets you copy, change one of your dice to match another dice, played or unplayed. So if you like, I need to get a five next to this five, you can use a repeat to do that. Or the rest lets you turn any dice into one you haven't rolled. So they're a little extra tool to help you manipulate your dice that you can earn while playing, but they're also worth points if you can hold on to them by the end and have the majority. So there's a nice push and pull there as well. And that's it. Yeah, you do six songs, so four round, uh, six rounds of rolling dice with then like doing all the bridge and the solos. And then at the very end of the game, you'll sit down, you'll score it all up, uh, take, get, in your, um, uh, get in your spotlight scores, your uh, stuff from your solo off your instruments, uh, anything from fans if you're playing with a fan expansion, the majorities, uh, the set scores, like what you got from a given set, and the harmonies. And you'll total your final score. Highest score wins. It's got a solo mode. Goes up to four players. Although I think technically you could play more, but it'd be, it, it, the songbook really isn't big enough, even though you've got enough instruments. That's it. 20 minutes. Just like you play it, you finish, you go, that was fun. Um, I, I wouldn't mind trying to master the instrument I got, or maybe I want to try a new instrument and see what that's like, how it changes the rules. Uh, and, and that's all of it. There's a expansion that includes um, three extra instruments. Um, and uh, there's a Kickstarter exclusive, which is the bit I was going to highlight. That has three Kickstarter exclusive instrument boards and a experimental sessions expansion. Um, this is the one thing I don't like because don't just just don't do this. Don't do gameplay Kickstarter exclusives. Yeah, cosmetics. Yeah, yeah, cosmetics. Yeah, like right now, if somebody jumps on the website for £35, they could buy the game um, with all the Kickstarter exclusives. But that's a limited print run and they're saying it's not going to be redone. So there's these three extra instruments that are, are gone. And you won't miss them if you're playing, but if you really like this game... You may feel bummed out that you you can't get these three extra instruments. Um, instead, like the the encore has three. It's got the congas, the flute, and the scat singer. Fantastic. Yeah, you know, great. The, there's you can buy like Kickstarter special dice color match to each and every single uh, instrument. Again, fine. That's cosmetic. But yeah, don't don't do this. Board games, board games are something that. Like it's the experience, the shared experience, not just sitting down with the people that you're playing with, but talking about the games after and being able to say, hey, you know, you check out this game, get this. And if you like it, then you can get this and this and this and build on it. Not, hey, you didn't throw money at this game while it's in the development stage. So there's this section of the game that's locked off forever. It feels you, bad. You like this instrument and you can't have it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, And you just I just... Uh, I think the organ is one of them. Yeah, the organ's one of the Kickstarter exclusive ones. And it just, it's a shame. And there will be some people who will look at your game and go, I'd love to buy it, but I can't have, I, I won't get everything. And that's quite common. People like, in the board game uh, community, tend, there's a number of people who are collectors who like to have a, I've got everything. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and so you're just... I have you're... no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> who could that be? Um, so I, yeah, that's it. That is my, I have to get to the fact that they've made this a Kickstarter exclusive to, to complain because everything else, it looks gorgeous. Um, it is small. The box is like not particularly deep. Uh, you get the insert is also the dice trays. 
Uh, everything fits nicely in there, even all of the expansions. It's all just boom, 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 and about eight. You know the smaller ticket to ride boxes? It's about that size. Maybe a little bit taller and wider, but the same thickness. Uh, it's a really good game, but um, and, and I thoroughly recommend it. And it's just, yeah, it's a fast game. It takes marginally longer than Railroad Inc. to play when you know what you're doing, but otherwise, uh, yeah. yeah. As I say, I'm going to teach this to the folks uh, over this weekend. And I don't expect them having any trouble learning how to play the game. Um, although I do expect some moments of, well, why did I do that? Uh, while we while we are um, going well, back Quite classic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we played um, Forest Shuffle with them as well. That's, uh, that'll be a fun one to talk about. Um, anyway, that's it. Do you guys have any questions about the gig? Or should we... Mm, uh... Not really. I mean, it, it seems like a, a fun game which... I would probably not get because, well, first off, jazz isn't really my uh, my, my jam, and I, 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 let's say I have, I am getting to a point where I have in, in enough game if that can can be said. I mean, can it can it be said? Can I say it? No one will be angry at me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you you can. I'm busy getting rid of a few games. Like I've ch uh, cut down on my roll and rights, and I've decided the gigs one I'm keeping. Um, the Twilight Inscription, the Twilight Imperium game. That's going though. It's just too much faff for what it is. I want a smooth, fast roll and write, and that this delivers um, yeah. in spades. Yeah. Uh, and I'm I'm not. Much of a jazz uh, fan, but from the little I know about jazz jams, uh, the way you you describe the game does fit what I know about it. So I would say that sounds like a good thing. Like if I had a friend that would be a fan of jazz, and, and I don't have a friend that's a fan of jazz, but that could be a nice uh, gift if they also like board games, of course. Yeah, yeah, it, it is dripping with jazz theme, and even the art style has this kind of retro feel to it. It's lacking in outlines. It's sort of very paper outline cut that um, feels very retro. You know, they've, they put a lot of work into it. They've thought about the um, the various different instruments and, and how to make them feel different. Of course, you don't have to like jazz to engage with this because it's... It's really just a roll and write, um, but the kind, it's less the kind, you know, some roll and writes are very like combo-y where you colour some boxes in and then they go, and now you can colour other boxes in and you colour other boxes in. This feels a bit more like um, Railroad Inc. where you're caring about the position of things and trying to organise that way. But um, I, I really like it, as I say. I would, as soon as I was like, I'm going to review this, I was also like, well, and we're going to play it. We're going to play it after I've talked about it, which usually they go on the shelf and sit for a while before I go back to them once I've reviewed them. But uh, yeah, that's the gig. Um, so uh, that was a jazzy experience, but we're going to take the tempo up several more notches uh, with Audrey and Forest Shuffle. Yes, um, we are switching to Forest Shuffle, which in French is called Forêt Mixte. Don't ask me why, but uh, I guess Forêt Mélangée would not have sounded great. Or Mélange de Forêt. Anyway, uh, this is a game uh, about nature, about forests, about animals, uh, about making a very complex uh, forest uh, in summary. It's a point salad game, so that's where at the end you're just like, oh, I'm going to have to count, but... That's all right. Um, it's just based on cards. So each player on their turn will draw two cards from different uh, possibilities or play a card. That's the only uh, actions that you have. Either draw the two cards, it's either from a, a draw pile that's uh, face down or there is a clearing where cards will accumulate over time when they are spent. So you get two cards uh, either from this. I think you can do one of each, if I'm not wrong, because you do one card, then another card. Uh, the, two, uh, the two card draws are separate from each other. And the other action to play a card from your hand, from your hand Quite a few of them have a cost to pay, but some it's all symbol based, and uh, you put it into play. So different type of cards. So you will have the trees, and you will have the animals. You need a tree to put the animals around, and the animal cards are split left, right, or top down. So you will put the top half of a card on top of a tree, the down card of the non 
the down half of a card under a tree, the left half left to a tree, and the right ha half right to a tree. So a tree can host four cards. Most of them will be animals. Some of the bottom halves are uh, plants like uh, strawberries uh, from the woods and uh, moss and stuff like that. Um, and for the gameplay itself, that's all there is to know. Everything else is basically card rules. And they will be comboted. Like, for instance, each type of trees. I'm not going to go into that because I'm not sure I could get the English translations of the different tree names. Um, will have its own way of scoring. Some of them will get, will say the first one gets you one point. At the second one, you get four points. Then if you have three, you get have eight points. Some of them will be five points uh, each tree, etc., etc. So you first put your trees, then your animals. And at the end, you will just count how many points you have to do comboting. For instance, the butterflies, it's uh, again, it's an increasing number of points depending on how many species of butterfly you have. Uh, some combos. That's where the game gets uh, a little bit smarter. It's the combos. Quite a few of the cards will let you play other cards for free. You don't have to pay the cost. The cost of uh, discarding some cards in the clearing. Uh, they have to have some special symbols because, for instance, all of the uh, deer type uh, of creatures with the hooves, uh, all, the all the creatures with hooves, share a symbol. For instance, uh, rats uh, can have their own thing. Butterflies, of course, are a symbol, etc. Et um, and so, yeah. Some of them will say, oh, as a free uh, action, if you have played this one, you can play this other thing. But if this other thing that you play has some, uh, when you play them, effect, it doesn't uh, happen because you can't do too many, let's say, cascades of actions. But uh, using something to then put butterfly, for instance, for free into play is fine because butterflies, they don't have extra effects than their points most of the time. So it's going to have to be smart against that, getting the combos, choosing which half of your card you want to use, um, and getting there. Now, how does the game end? During the setup, there were three winter cards that were played into the bottom third of the game, and as soon as the third winter card is drawn, the game ends. Players then count their points. Of course, with this kind of setup, depending on how many players you are, the game will take uh, will be shorter. You will feel that you have played less rounds. Uh, for instance, when, when you are four, if the, the maximum number of cards will be split uh, between all the players, and you will generally play less than uh, when you are three. Uh, we played two players, and we had a few cards that were taken out, out of the deck. I think when you are three players, this doesn't happen, but I'm not sure. Uh, and there are probably in each case a few cards, maybe three or four, that are taken out for a little bit of variation, but I'm really not sure about that uh, part. So it does feel that when you are two players, you will, you can end up with 250 points, and when you will be three or four, you will end up with 150, maybe 125. And so it's very hard to compare number of points scored from a game to another one if the number of players aren't the same. There is also a small little thing. It's every player has a grotto card. I hope it's called a grotto in English. Or cave. Maybe. I think it's a cave. I can't okay. remember. But yeah, and, I think cave. And on some very particular conditions, like when playing the bear card, you can store up cards in your cave, uh, sometimes from the clearing. Uh, and uh, that lets you... It's another way to build points for the end, and also sometimes to take cards away from uh, the other players. Because I think that the bear lets you take cards from the clearing and put them into uh, into your cave. If it's not the bear, it's another card, but there are two or three cards that manipulate the Grotto only. Um, and so you can like prevent the other players from getting cards. Also, the clearing is limited in space. I think it's six or nine uh, cards maximum that can go in there. Once it's full, every card uh, in the clearing are removed and um, there are two other ones that are drawn because there always needs to be at least one or two cards in the clearing unless of course players only draw one 
from it, uh, and that can accelerate getting to the end. So there is also a little bit more, uh, let's say, depth uh, on the game than just playing your uh, animals and getting to the points, because you can also manipulate a little bit the clearing, which is the most interaction with the other players uh, that you will get by taking a card that you know someone would want and that you can actually use just to spend, maybe. And then they will have to wait for it to go back to, to them, for instance. Or you can you can know that someone is would be very interesting in two of these cards because for instance they've been playing Oak uh, a lot and this would there, are, there is another Oak that would work well um, and you can take that Oak and then use it actually yourself and prevent them from uh, having it or using a maybe it's the bear again to take things out of the clearing so it's still not a very a game with high player interaction to be honest. Uh, really, really not a lot. And in my opinion, the hardest thing in the game is not forgetting points at the end. Uh, like uh, is the case anyway with most uh, salad points games. Uh, you you really, really at the end are like, oh, I have a, how I counted this? Hmm, did I forget to count this type of trees? No. But uh, in my opinion, that's just uh, something that you have to do. And what matters most anyway is, is the game itself. And you have so many possibilities all the time. Like it's, in my opinion, it's not a game where you end up stuck. It, it's more like, oh, I have three options. Which one do I do? Because uh, I I cannot do all of them at the time. And so I I really don't think, in my opinion, that it's a game that can be frustrating. Uh, but it's a calculative one for sure. Yeah, but definitely. Also, my, my impression from from my play is that there's always something you can do, and um, yeah. So um, I really like that about Forest Shuffle. But yeah, I had a plan, and no, it didn't get the card I wanted. But hey, I could still do something else. And um... yeah, um, isn't the name of the game a bit of a, a pun in German? Um, <laughs> the, 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 not really. I, I mean, um, uh, I, I checked in, in, in German, the game is called Mischwald. A Mischwald is a forest that's basically a mixture of different types of trees, not just um, leafy trees um, or just um, the other type of trees. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, um, Nadelbäume. Um, yeah, in French, it would be conifer for you. Yeah. Um, so, um, and the Mischwald is basically, hey, everything is there, uh, everything is mixed together, and um, at the same time, shuffle is translated, uh, to shuffle is translated as mission. So, um, forest shuffle would be Wald mission, uh, but the German term for a forest with different types of trees is a Mischwald. Um, so, yeah. Not really a pun, but um, kind of. Wait, it's it's a clever play on words. Uh, I'd say that's what I kind of what I meant. It's quite, uh... yeah. Um, right for myself, I played this with my uh, with, with with the folks. We live on the island, and they they're here, you know, uh, reasonably often. Um, they got to grips with the mechanics, uh, but definitely had trouble with getting just a bit sort of lost in how um you just kind of until you've had a bunch of reps with the game you, it's very hard to work out what you should be doing on a given time you've always got something you can do but i, I noticed like everyone was getting a bit lost with the exception of myself because for me uh i was like oh well it's a big deck game so it's like arc nova and it's like race to the galaxy where you're just asked do the best you can with what you get as you get it and and go from there. Um, it's got an expansion coming, Alpine, I think it is. I quite like the game, but I also do feel it's really messy. Um, I don't find it particularly clean with what you're doing. Like the trees and the laying everything out is, is fantastic. I like, you know, you put the animals left and right and above and below is so they're kind of nesting in the given environment. Um, but I, I don't know, we, we played it then, and we've played it once since, and we haven't really been back to it. It's sort of sat on the shelf, and it's been like, we could just play 
Goit Rome or Ucronia or um, Race of the Galaxy or Ark Nova, they all kind of scratch the same itch. So I don't know where I land with it because obviously it had a big, big lot of hype. Um, but I think it's decidedly okay. It's just, it's like scores can get into the hundreds and it feels uh, like adding up is a bit, bit much. It feels almost like this game would have been better if it had been digital only. Um, like, I think there's another game. With something that can count for yourself. Yeah, something that's just tracking things as you go and, and highlighting this, this, this and this. And admittedly, you can get to all of that with experience. But I just can't help but feel maybe it'd be, it would be a bit smoother for me, at least. Just played um, played with a good digital app. Um, I, like the, I, I think the game's very good. I like the game a lot. Um, but I don't like the counting. Um and I definitely noticed we played four players and the game absolutely bogged down for people who um, were less experienced with this type of game. Um, they felt very overwhelmed with all the choices. Whereas I'm just like, look at what you got, pick a lane, head at it and swerve only if um, things are looking pretty bad. Uh, but the final scores were pretty close. So even though they felt like they didn't know what they were doing, they were able to keep up reasonably well. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I think yeah, Everdell. Everdell's something that I've played with them as well, and they said that that had a familiar feel, but Everdale was much easier for them to get the grips with because there was the cards were doing less each. These cards do so much. Each card is like, what is it like? Two cards? It's unless they're trees. It's like woof. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, I I actually have only played it digitally on board game arena. And um, yeah, I can imagine having to do all these all this counting and calculating the points by myself would be a hassle. Um, but what I really liked, I played with my uh, best friend who has played it before in physical form, and um, and I kind of got thrown in there and um, skimmed the rules, and we just started playing. And for me, it was basically, I mean, I, I studied biology and it was kind of, oh yeah, cool butterflies. Hey, I can collect butterflies and get points for it. So now I collect butterflies. And so um, it, yeah, it was, was really nice. Just like feeling like the feeling of walking through a forest and just seeing what, what what's there and just being happy with, 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 with whatever you encounter. And um yeah, you have reminded me of the other game, which when when Audrey uh, said I'm going to talk about um, Forest Shuffle, um, there's another game that mechanically it's not the same, but Meadow. Meadow really has that feeling you talked about of like wandering through a place and encountering things along the way. Um, and it has you building a little tableau as well. And if you've not played Meadow, I really thoroughly, thoroughly recommend you give it a look because... Uh, it is it's giving me what I wanted from Forest Shuffle without the maths. Um, so, yeah, uh, although uh, that's the thing, considering how complex the scoring is, actually playing Forest Shuffle never felt overwhelming. It was always like, OK, well, I've got this um, creature here and it wants these type of creatures and I just put them in these places. Or like you said, the butterflies that just go, hey, collect lots of different butterflies. And that's. That was something that one player got to grips with very quickly. It was just like, okay, I want, I want butterflies. I want, I want different butterflies. And that was a nice, easy handle to get to grips with the game. But like I say, that's it. You play these big deck games and the biggest thing you can ever do when you're first learning them is you just pick something and go, I'm going to try and do this and learn the game by trying to do this. And maybe it will win and maybe it won't, but at least I will, I know what I'm focusing on um, because it takes away other play, some of yeah. the choices and some yeah. of the time. Yeah, I, I focused on... There's the two animals that are different that you're getting in pairs. That was what I focused on on my first game. Um, they go on the left and right side of the trees. I think one's a bird and the other's something else. Is it battened, battened the dormouse or something like that? Batten mouse. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's it, batten. Yeah, the bat and whatever the other thing that goes with it is... Um, yeah, they're like squirrel mice type things. And they sit either side and you want them in pairs. That was how I, that was my handle for getting to grips with the game. I think I did win, but I said it wasn't by much. Um, 
and an advantage because I've got several thousand games of Race for the Galaxy under my belt, so I'm very good at just looking and quickly assessing and going, this seems like the best thing for me, I'm not going to worry about the rest. So, yeah. Yeah, here we played uh, with my husband at the uh, club, where we go for board gaming and uh, role-playing games. So we were going for, because it's every Friday evening and Saturday afternoon and evening, and we were a bit late uh, for the starting of uh, Saturday afternoon. So we were given that to, oh, you can play this while we, fin uh, while we finish our Ark Nova, and we will join you after. So let's say we waited a little bit. Um, and uh, we, we played it so ju just once, but uh, I enjoyed it, but definitely that's not something that I would buy, knowing that I've played it once. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm uh, I'm quite like, I, I'm not going to get the expansion. I don't think I need more. Um, oddly as well, now we're talking about it, um, in addition to Meadow, it also made me think of um, Arboretum, which is a different game, obviously. But like, if you've not played it, it's basically about putting trees in certain patterns. It's a really vicious game about um, building an Arboretum, and that's another fun one within the nature theme that... I, I quite like to to recommend for people. So, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, yeah, Forest Shuffle, I think, is a solid 7 out of 10 for me. Like, a good game, I'll always play it if somebody's like, hey, let's play Forest Shuffle. Um, no, I'm, uh, happy. I'm, I'm happy I played it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I'm going to be, like, say, let's let's play Forest Shuffle. Actually, if, if you're in a situation and and um, if it's two players, I'm going to be like, let's play Race of the Galaxy. But if it's more than that, I'm going to pull out my copy of Glory to Rome and say, I know this looks like ass because I've got the Cambridge edition with the terrible cartoons. But trust me, it's really good. Ooh, is that the... Oh, that is, that is a really nice box. Yeah, what I find fascinating is there are basically three different cover artworks. There is like the... Mm, widespread American one, um, then there is the Japanese one, and there is the Polish one. Though the Polish one is basically the American one just zoomed in and with more vibrant colors, kind of. And um, the Japanese one kind of looks sad. Or, it looks sad, but it's also like. I actually think, um, and and do have a Google of these different box images if you want to know what we're talking about. But the Japanese one, the backdrop is really striking, and then it's these it's just this rabbit and fox are just kind of glued in, and they barely match. Um, but that's often the case that the animals look really a bit kind of superimposed into what's going on. Um, I, yeah, I guess ultimately I think I land mixed on on it. Uh, I think I'd be way higher on it if I hadn't played Meadow beforehand, which oh, I, I'm going to have to talk about Meadow, I think, at some point, because, yeah, that is I so agree. satisfying that you, you have these like little um, environments and then uh, you will modify them again by playing like different animals. But then uh, animals in other environments will let you play in this one. And there's a whole grid you're collecting from so she has like everdale mixed with forest shuffle mixed with a nice little uh, walk but yeah yeah okay um i think i think that's enough about forest shuffle yeah yeah yep so uh here to leave you all with a bang of sonic symphony it's cara on lead for banner festival take it away a one two three all right, so Banner Festival, or um, also Tidal Blades 1.5. Um, I have talked about Tidal Blades Part 1, Heroes of the Reef, before on the podcast. A, um, a worker placement uh, dice building game um, where you play a hero uh, trying to comp and compete with other um, heroes to... Uh, for fame to be uh, enrolled in the much-coveted uh, um, group of Tidal Blades, um, a group of uh, very influential, powerful heroes who defend the archipelago where Tidal Blades is set against monsters and such. Um, Part one, because they announced two more parts. Part two is supposed to be to arrive 
sometime in the next half year, I believe. Um, it's a dungeon crawler where you basically play the heroes and you fight monsters in a dungeon crawl type game. Um, I don't think there is any info about part three yet. Um, but um, it's definitely going to be a different type of game again. And um, after they uh, released part one, Heroes of the Reef, and um, crowdfunded part two, they did a direct to um, retail release of Banner Festival, which is a, a small game set in the same universe where you take on the role of a merchant guild and um, Basically, there is this banner festival um, where all the merchants converge um, and basically compete for uh, honor and prestige uh, to get the best opportunities for trade and such. Um, it's a kind of betting game. Um, no, 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 not betting game. It's um, um, I know the German word Stichspiel. Um, so, sorry, can't help with translating from Dutch. So basically, it's a card game. Everyone trick plays Trick taking? It. Yeah, trick, -taking, trick -taking. taking. Yes, thank you. And um, so the game is played over um, three rounds. Each round consists of seven or eight bouts. Um, depending on player count, um, each bout plays out the same way. Um, the lead player moves the trade gate. The game board is a circle, and uh, in the middle um, there um, are eight spaces numbered where basically the player boats are and move around. And around those are eight other um, slots in four different colors. And um, there is a trade gate, um, basically like the uh, government uh, basically says, hey, here you can trade now to kind of direct trade and not have everyone trade wherever they want uh, for some reason. And um, so the lead player can move this trade gate one to four spaces clockwise, um, which is important because the color of the space the trade gate is on determines um, how the tricks are played. And um, after the trade gate is moved, every player simultaneously plays a card from hand. In a two to four player game, um, everyone has eight cards on their hand. In a five player game, every card one has seven cards on their hand. Cards come in four different colors, yellow, uh, violet, orange, and turquoise, and a um, number from zero to nine. Um, depending on the color, where the trade gate stands, that color uh, trumps the other colors. Uh, so everyone chooses a card um, hidden, uh, place them in the middle, once everyone has chosen their card, they get revealed and you check, hey, who um, wins this trick, um, who loses and which players are basically in the middle. Depending on that, different things happen. The person who has the highest ranked card um, gets to move their own uh, watercraft to the current gates, uh, trade gates position uh, in a clockwise order, um, <clears throat> which um, is helpful because once you finish basically one round on, on the circle with your watercraft, you reveal um, a the top card from your character deck and um, this basically just gives you bonus points at the end of the game. So the first card gives you one point, when you reveal another card, the next card gives you three points, then six points, ten points, fifteen points, 21 and finally 28 points if you manage to get to the last card. So that's one way of scoring points. Just try to win all the tricks, get through to through your deck and reveal the highest scoring card in the end. Um, <clears throat> the person with who, who's ranked lowest in this trick um, 
gets to do the ability of the card they played. Each number has a different ability um, and only the player who scored the lowest in the trick gets to use the ability, but nothing else. And finally, everyone else who is neither the least, the, the, the lowest player nor the highest player um, gets to place a banner in the quadrant the trade gate is currently in. Um, that part is basically an area control um, game um, where you go... Um, oh, I'm missing so many English words today. Um, it happens, it's fine. It's... Uh, anyway, so um, you go along a, a path and uh, the first spot that corresponds to the card you played um, and isn't, isn't occupied yet, there you place one of your banners. Um, if all uh, places are occupied, there's one left where as many players can place their banner as they want, uh, the towers. And um, <clears throat> depending on the spot, you also get some reward. Most notably, um, the kind of a signature component of the Tidal Blades game so far, the squishy fruit. Um, Tidal Blades uh, Heroes of the Reef had, had the squishy fruit. These one have squishy star fruits. So yeah, you can squish them. And they are little star fruits. So, um, and they have glitter in them. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, yeah, once everyone has resolved um, the trick, next bout is played. Um, until basically everyone has played all the cards, which also means if you are very perceptive and remember which cards got played already, you can determine like what other players might have left. Um, and yeah, once everyone has played all the cards, you do a scoring phase where you um, check basically this air control portion, like who has the most banners in a re region, basically one half of the board game, two quadrants together. Um, this player gets six bonus points, the second player gets three bonus points, and the, um, the third player gets one bonus point, and then you remove all banners start a new round, you do this three times, and then you do the final uh, scoring. One additional thing that happens with the squishy fruits, um, at the start of the game, the, the pool of squishy fruits is created depending on player count. And um, so for example, in a four player game, you have 11 squishy fruits. And once there are no more fruits in the pool, you have a feast and uh, basically all the fruit gets eaten uh, and the player with the most fruit gets uh, bonus points and um, yeah, bonus points uh, equal to the fruits they've collected. Um, everyone else gets half of their fruits in points and then all fruits get returned. And uh, yeah, so that's a nice thing. You, you eat the fruits, um, don't eat the fruits. Um, yeah, so that's basically the game. Um, so at the end, uh, end you check uh, if there is another um, feast to do. Uh, you count all your uh, victory points you collected. You check your character top character card and uh, one uh, card. Um, the, the nine card basically gives you also just victory points. So you check, hey, have you played a nine card? And <clears throat> and that's it. It's um, quite fast to play. It felt a little bit random to me, maybe because I'm not used to this type of game. So I suck at uh, thinking about what other players might have in their hand and what would be the best choice to play right now. So um, I'm just playing something. Um, but I think it's really interesting that it's not just, oh, damn, I lost this turn, so uh, better luck next time. But even if you lose, you get something. And um, you can even um, basically bet on that and say, hey, I really would like to, 
I don't know, you know, the, the one card has the ability to gain one fruit and it wants your watercraft, two spaces, and you think, hey, that's really good for me right now, um, so I might have a chance to win this uh, trick with another card, but I'll play this one because one card, uh, the number one, I likely lose, so I will get the ability instead. And um, yeah, basically every turn, every player gets something. Yeah. Do you want to win and advance your watercraft fast, or do you want to specifically not win and you want to lose to get the ability, or do you say, hey, I actually don't want to win and don't want to lose because I want to play spanners. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, as I said, it's uh, sometimes called Title Blades 1.5 because it's, you know, it's set in the same universe as the other games. Um, it's not part of this, uh, hey, we have these heroes that fight monsters thing. It's just flashing out a little bit of the world. Um, so mm. I really like that. Yeah, yeah, that it's... doesn't sound like a game where I would play too much because you know me, you know how I enjoy uh, opposition, and that sounds like there might be just a smidge too much for me. Not uh, so much that I would completely go away and say, oh no, I don't want this, but uh, just enough to say, yeah, I, I would play it with, with a friend uh, if, if they bring it, but I'm definitely not. That's not something I would add to my uh, shelves. Yeah, I think I can say I'm I'm not really much into the Tidal Blade series. It's never grabbed me particularly. It's a case of so many games, um, so few options. But it is interesting to see a like you know trick taking um, addition to the whole thing. So although uh, isn't it? Huh. No, I was trying to remember who the designer is, but. What I like the most in Tidal Blades is uh, all the, the components and the boards and so many, so much turquoise. Mm, they do, <laughs> they do look really, really like pretty. It's really nice table presence without being overboard. It's, it's in beautiful wooden pieces and things. It's uh... yeah, um, same here. Uh, basically, you have the squishy fruit, which is awesome, and um, the banners are wooden discs with uh, basically. Uh, there are five trading houses uh, that you play and with their logo on them. Um, so yeah, the components are great. Um, I mean, if, if you're not interested in uh, the, the title Blade series, um, that's weird, but totally fair. Uh, <laughs> it's, I've, got, I've got too many games. I'm in the process of uh, letting go ones that I'm not quite so interested in getting back on the table mm -hmm. again. So yes. Getting one that I look at and go, oh, that's pretty, but I don't know. It's a bit, um, for me, a bit kitsch. Um, yeah, that, I, yeah, it's, I think it's, I'm less about games with, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is about the Tidal Blaze series, but every time I see it, I'm like, oh, that's very pretty and it's very interesting. And then it just disappears from my mind. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> and uh, it's, I don't know. It has a very um, pastel effect, aesthetic. It does. I love, I love a good pastel game. Some of my favorite games are nicely yeah. pastel. I mean, it's, uh, what, what I really like about the whole series, um, kind of drifting away from the core topic here, but um, is that, I mean, it kind of is, is something that we already know. You know, you are heroes, you defend this place against monsters. That's not something inherently new and inventive. Um, even, you know, the dungeon crawl thing. Oh, great. Now you do it in a dungeon crawl style. Yeah. But Ooh, dungeon crawls, that's uh, <laughs> not been around since the 19. <laughs> well, is it 60s or 70s? It's whenever. Um... Well, I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> when board games are played by so many neurotypical uh, people that love being in their comfort zone, I mean, why not another dungeon crawler? <laughs> <laughs> but what I mm. find really different here about other games like this or, or series like this, it's bright. Uh, the, the, the generic dungeon crawl or the generic you hear us fight monster game is dark. Yeah, it's gritty. And um, this one, you know, you have these, you have these characters on their surfboards or whatever, and. 
um, you have uh, in the first uh, part um, you have this big arena where people cheer you on and yeah hey and it's more like a sport a sport event and competition and oh by the way there are also monsters you are fighting from time to time and um, yeah I mean from the from the brightness aesthetics it's it's kind of like the avatar films um, you know and so that's something I, I think that's really different. I, I really like it for a change. And um, I also, I'm, I'm a sucker for game series. So if there are multiple games set in the same world, that's like, oh yeah. Um, I mean, that's why I'm, I've started to collect all these, uh, you know, uh, West Kingdom, um, South Tigris and so such games. Um, Ooh, unfortunately, that means you have to have all of the, the North Sea ones and only one of those three is any good. <laughs> yeah. and but, but what sucks about these series, they are all worker placement games. Yeah. Um, um, mate, yeah. I, I'd say Paladins. It does have worker placement stuff in it, but I... I feel like it's something a bit more than that. With the if, I mean, stuff. yes, every one, every game has their its own yeah. thing, but all of them are also worker placement games. And with the Tidal Blade series, every game is really different from the others. And that is something to uh, to uh, enjoy and respect. That is, yeah. 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 So it's, basically. Hey, um, with the free Tidal Blades games that have been released or will be released soon, you have a dice building worker placement game. You have a dungeon crawler with um, also like a. Um, ah, I, I'm, my, my brain is, is, is on hiatus today. Um, you know, uh, like in Kingdom Death Monster with uh, the uh, gear grids. Um, oh right, yeah, it, yeah, aligning yeah. things on a board. And yeah, uh, there isn't really a name for, tableau for that building, yet. Uh, but yeah, like a positional based sort of puzzle yeah. thing. And it's yeah. and here you have a trick taking game with area control elements. So yeah, it's the, I, I really love that, and I'm really looking forward to their um, role playing game set in the same you know world. So yeah, I I think. I, I think it sounds interesting. I also think you, if Alessio had been here, you'd uh, you'd have a way more receptive audience. <laughs> uh, you've unfortunately run into two people who are a bit like, oh, it sounds nice, but <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, yeah. No, I, I you, you, it sounds great. It's just not my jam, and that's it. That's the only thing. It's like um, same uh, Druid City Games published Wonderland's War, which I watch people play, and it sounds great. And again, it's just. I don't think it's my jam, even though it's gorgeous and obviously a really good game. That's just sometimes you can look at something and go, "Yeah, this is amazing," and it's not for me. Which is, yeah, this sounds sounds like what this is with Tidal Blades is the whole the whole series. I don't know. Maybe I, I could see like if my nephew um, board gamed, he would love it because he's like a. A surfer, he's a um, well, surfer and a fireman now, but he's a you know a brand representative. I bet he'd be well into these thematics for sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's that is uh, tidal uh, uh, tidal blades. Uh, which one was it again? Banner um, festival. Banner festival, as opposed to what the others, heroes of the reef and rise of the unfolders. That's the. That's the dungeon crawler, yeah? Rise of the yes, Unfolders. Exactly. Yeah, that, that what what are unfolders? Are they like is that the when you open the board up and um yeah, basically there's this fold. Uh, like uh, years ago, uh, with lots of magic, the there was this fold created, like a, a mist or whatever, where all the monsters got trapped in, but it kind of unravels and monsters coming out of there are the unfolders. Oh, yeah, um, it's, a, Plastic, it's, not, it's an interesting Plastic name. Cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, still, I will. I will continue to admire Tidal Blades from a distance, um, and I'm glad you really enjoy it. And maybe it is for the people who are listening. Um, I certainly think there's a lot of things to recommend about it, but you know, with that uh, last squeak of the trumpet, indicates that this. Uh, this gig is over. Thank you for listening. 
You've been a fantastic audience. And as such, uh, it's adieu from Audrey. Bye-bye. Cheerio from Kara. Bye. And farewell from Fen. Farewell. And remember that the last E in Stand E stands for improvisation. I've improvised that an I can be an E. Wow. Oh. <laughs> So and I hope that really annoys someone. <laughs> <laughs> just one per just just annoys one person. That's good enough for me.